Good afternoon. Welcome to MCIE's Trans Transition to Adulthood Fall Webinar Series, which is being co-sponsored by Brooks Publishing. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Barb Gruber from MCIE, and I will be your facilitator for this webinar. During the session, you will be muted, and you can type questions in the chat window, and they will be answered as they come up or at the end of the session. Uh, we hope you can join us for our spring series. There will again be three sessions, and these will include, as you can see, Demystifying Transition Assessment with Colleen Toma and Ronald Tamura on January 27th, um, and then Transition Planning for Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Youth with Disabilities with Gary Green on February 24th, and then uh, finally Best Practices in Transition Planning to Promote the Employment of Youth with Significant Disabilities with Paul Wayman on March 31st. And the advertising for that will go up shortly. Oh, sorry, Carrie. <laughs> Wrong button. Technical difficulty here. Right, that isn't going to work for me right this second. All right, so we're just going to move on. I wanted to tell you before we started, though, that um, you can get the, by registering for today, you'll have an exclusive 30% discount on any of the Brooks books authored by the webinar presenters for both the spring and the fall. Um, and when I send a follow-up email, I'll send you that code. Uh, today's session is on self-determination and transition for students with disabilities with Carrie Shogren. Um, Dr. Carrie Shogren is an associate professor in the Department of Special Education and, Associ and associate director of the Kansas University Center on Developmental Disabilities at the University of Kansas. Her research focuses on self-determination and systems of support for students with disabilities. In addition, Carrie has a specific interest in multiple nested contextual factors that impact student outcomes. So it's my pleasure to turn the session over to you, Carrie. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction, Barb, and thanks to everyone that's on the phone for being here today, joining in. I know immediately after the Thanksgiving holiday, we're all feeling busy probably and getting back into work, so I appreciate everyone being here. Um, as Barb did mention, there is the chat box, which I'm assuming you all see and have on your screen. So please feel free as we're going through the session today to jot down questions or thoughts that you might have and send them there. I'll do my best to kind of track those as we're going through um, so that we can address any questions, comments, ideas, or anything that people have. I always say in doing webinars, I miss the interaction with the audience that you get in that face-to-face. -face. So hopefully we can use the chat tool or other pieces um, for people to be introducing some comments or other thoughts. So again, please feel free to use that. And I will also try to save at least a couple of minutes at the very end for questions if there's anything as we wrap up that people would like to talk about. Um, so again, welcome everyone, thanks for being here. My name's Carrie Shogren, and our goal today is to talk a little bit about self-determination and transition. Um, as Barb mentioned, um, you know, and as is up on the screen that you can all see, um, Brooks is publishing um, a great series on a number of topics relevant to transition. And um, so the book that I've done is on self-determination and transition planning. So I'm going to highlight um, some of the key areas related to self-determination and transition and try to do kind of a broad view of some of the critical things to be thinking about. I know in terms of the people excuse me, that are on the phone. We probably have a diversity of interest and expertise in these areas. So hopefully everyone will be able to find some pieces that are relevant for what they're doing. Although please feel free to share ideas um, in the chat box as we're going through. Now, as we're getting started, what I wanted to start with today, and I'm going to go kind of quickly through the next few slides, but I wanted to at least make sure that we were all on the same page in terms of what we're talking about when we're thinking about self-determination. 
So up on the screen here is um, a definition that's pretty widely used in the special education field of self-determination. It says that self-determination is volitional actions that enable one to act as the primary causal agent in one's life and to maintain or improve one's quality of life. So as you see on kind of the second half of the screen there, there's really three main components to this this idea of acting volitionally, of being a causal agent, and of quality of life. Really, what we're talking about here is supporting youth um, with disabilities, um, with different support needs, to act pur purposefully, to be doing things with the intent of making things happen in their life. Um, so we're looking to support them to develop the skills and attitudes that allow them to do that. And what these self-determined behaviors, the actions and causal agency looks like, that's all going to be really influenced by quality of life, by what skills and attitudes and goals um, each individual student is going after, which is why a key part of promoting self-determination is understanding each student, understanding their goals, and understanding their support needs. So I also thought, in addition to all the words that we have up here about self-determination and what it is, um, that I would also use a quote. Um, and this is actually from a family um, that's highlighted throughout um, the Self-Determination and Transition book. But this is actually a mother um, of Michael. And Michael is a young man that's going through the process of transitioning from school to the adult world. And this is what his mother was saying about um, transition and self-determination for them. And I'm going to kind of read quickly through this just in case anyone's not seeing the slides. But so she said transition is kind of a huge deal. So when we planned his transition to adulthood, we were doing a move, a change of schools, a change of jobs all at once. So there were a number of different transitions for Michael and his family going on. We decided up front that self-determination was going to be an integral part of the transition process. We set everything up so Michael could make choices and everything with, would be with his interests and preferences in mind. We went slowly. First, we just did weekends at the new location. When we actually made the move, we took him to the new school, he started his new job, and we noticed almost no behavior problems. When we'd had transitions in the past, like going from elementary to middle school, we've had no sleep, screaming, and aggression. But this transition was different because we built in Michael's self-determination. We focused on his choices and preference, even his preferences for going slowly. After we made the move, there were still so many changes, but he was fine. He was able to handle all of them. I think that's the power of self-determination. So Michael is a young man with multiple disabilities, with very extensive communication-related support needs. So for him, he requires a lot of support to um, enable him to express and use his self-determination skills to be that causal agent over his life. And as you can see from this quote, it took time for them and his family and his supports to be able to figure out effective ways um, where he didn't have to use um, problem behaviors to communicate the things that he wanted and that he needed. But as his family was able to learn and grow in that process, they were able to build in ways that his choices and preferences were a part of that process. And um, as you see from this example, it uh, facilitated effective transition outcomes. So what we're really looking for in promoting self-determination is supporting people to learn and have opportunities to make choices and decisions, to exhibit some personal or in internal control over their actions, so to have ways to effectively express those choices and decisions. And then to feel capable, to feel as though if they engage in these choices and decisions and these actions, um, that they're going to be able to obtain the outcome that they're looking for. So really what we're looking to do is to um, teach, provide opportunities, and provide supports and accommodations that facilitate these outcomes. So the pieces of teaching skills, teaching the actual elements of self-determination, choice-making, decision-making, are critically important. Another really important piece that we don't always talk as much about um, but is really important to be thinking about is how to provide those opportunities. We can teach skills, but if environments aren't structured in a way that facilitate um, students being successful, being able to um, 
have the supports and accommodations they need to express themselves and their self-determination and their agency, it's going to be a struggle. And then supports and accommodations are a key piece. And these are going to be individualized to each student. Some students may benefit from technologically based supports. For example, for Michael, a big thing for him was having access to different technologies and different um, programs and apps that are available now so that he could use pictures and other tools to make choices. So those could be up on the screen and he could use that as a way to communicate what his interests and preferences were. For other individuals, these may be picture-based things. They may be, you know, just a list of different strategies for making an effective choice. It can be a number of different resources and tools. But the ultimate goal is to both teach structure that environment to provide opportunities, and then identify the most effective supports and accommodations for each student. And the idea is that if we're teaching, creating these opportunities, providing the supports, this is going to lead to youth being self-determined and expressing these outcomes. So I, I think a valid question or something to ask or think about is why self-determination? Why do we talk about this? as part of transition and as a key element to be embedding into already crowded and busy instructional days and activities. And um, I'm sure you know most of us on the phone, um, because we're here today, because we're interested in this topic, um, you know, feel that self-determination is an important outcome. But there's a growing body of research that's really documenting the direct impact of self-determination on adult outcomes. We very recently did a study um, where we were tracking almost 800 youth, a few less than 800, um, looking at, as they were moving from school to post-school environments, the impact that self-determination was having for them. So we actually did an assessment of self-determination as they were leaving school, and we're then looking at um, what their adult outcomes were one and two years post-school. And we found that those youth of those 800, if they were leaving school with higher levels of self-determination, um, they actually showed significantly higher employment outcomes, meaning being employed as well as having access to a job that provided benefits, opportunities for growth, and so on, as well as greater community access, meaning having ways to get around in the community, participate in activities in the community. And this actually was maintained one and two years post-school. So youth with the lower levels of self-determination tended to, you know, sometimes um, their outcomes would start to fall off, especially in that second year. But we saw less of that in the group with higher levels of self-determination. And so the idea would be that by having these skills to advocate, to make choices and decisions, to go after the things you want, this is leading to um, enhanced outcomes in these areas. And also about half of the students um, that we were following one and two years post-school also had participated in different studies with us over time looking at the impact of self-determination interventions being implemented in secondary school. And as you might expect, those youth that had higher, or that had access to those interventions in school tended to leave school with higher levels of self-determination and then they tended to have more positive post-school outcomes. So this is really suggesting positive benefits of thinking about self-determination that answer that why question um, that we may sometimes ask ourselves or that we may be asked by others in terms of why is this an important area to focus in on. So let's move forward and talk a little bit about how we actually support youth um, to become self-determining. And what's actually up on the screen now um, is related to how we can assess self-determination and see where students are in terms of their levels of self-determination. Um, I think an important piece um, that we kind of sometimes miss in the process is actually thinking about, well, how can we know what to teach students? Oops, sorry, slides are moving forward. Okay, I'm back on the one I was talking about. I'm, I apologize, I'm not sure why we jumped. Um, but so as I was saying, we really wanna think about how do we know what skills are going to be important to teach students? How do we know if students are making progress after we've implemented instruction to teach self-determination skills? So the goal here is to really think about assessment first and then ongoing assessment. 
this is actually a graph generated um, from a scale that some of you may be familiar with called the ARC self-determination scale. Um, this is a relatively commonly used assessment of self-determination. These scores are actually from the short form of that scale that we've created that's slightly um, shorter in length than the full-scale version. Um, and that's actually included in um, the Brooks book um, if people are interested in looking at that. But what I've done here is created a graph. And so I've created these graphs with a number of the different teachers we've worked with on different projects where students completed the scale and then we broke it down. The scale has four different subscales, these four key features of self-determination, autonomy, um, self-regulation, psychological empowerment, or self-realization. And those are related to that idea of autonomy, being able to make choices and decisions as needed, self-regulation, kind of that self-management goal setting process. And then the empowerment and self-realization are feeling capable, knowing yourself and so on. So from this profile that we have here, we see that in terms of the students' overall self-determination, they're kind of somewhere in the middle in terms of their score. But if you look at the different subscales, so the dark bar would be the student score, and then the gray bar that extends out beyond it would be the total points that were possible. So this student is scoring lower in autonomy and self-regulation um, than the other two dimensions. So that may mean we want, might want to focus in on some areas that might benefit um, autonomy and self-regulation. So that may be then thinking about, I've got a slide on the next page, of some of those skills that we may teach related to self-determination. So for example, from that previous profile, we might focus in on choice making, decision making, problem solving, goal setting skills. We may kind of really think about, well, does this student need some support to learn how to make choices? Or does he need some type of guideline for how to go through a systematic decision making process? For students that had a different profile, maybe they're scoring lower in self-awareness or self-knowledge. It may be um, implementing elements related to disability knowledge and um, other pieces like that. So this information can help us um, to figure out some of the things we might want to target in our instruction. Because we don't have time to go through ways to teach each of these skills specifically today, but there are um, available lots of different instructional strategies for teaching choice making, for teaching problem solving, um, for teaching any of these elements um, that may be of interest to the student. Um, also, there's a number of curricula out there um, that can be used to support some combination of these skills or to target in on specific skills. For example, there's something called the self-advocacy strategy um, that was developed to specifically target some of the self-advocacy skills. So that may be something that would be relevant for students. Um, the choice maker curriculum that some of you may be familiar with both focuses on choice making skills as well as some of those decision making and problem solving skills. And a lot of these curricula now have been evaluated in different research studies and found to be effective in promoting self-determination. Um, so that what I want to do for the rest of our time today, and again, I, I feel like I'm just kind of talking, and obviously I'm the only one that has voice in this, but if there are questions or points of discussion or if anyone wants to share something that they're doing in any of these areas, feel free to use the chat box. Um, and type a message. Um, but otherwise, I'll keep going because what I want to highlight is um, a specific model of instruction um, that we've used in a lot of our work here at KU around supporting the development of many of these different components of self-determined behavior. Um, it's called the self-determined learning model of instruction, and it really focuses on teaching students how to set goals, make decisions, and then manage um, their behavior through the process of attempting to attain a goal. So this intervention targets a number of these different areas um, that may be very important and useful for students. So, as I said, um, the SDLMI, it's really a teaching model um, that combines direct instruction, direct instruction in many of these skills related to choice, decision, problem solving, goal setting, as well as um, ways to actively involve the student in that process. So the SDLMI was really developed out of work to try to figure out how to give students 
um, some type of strategy or process that they would go through to identify and go after a goal. Um, because if you think about for all of us, we all set goals in our lives and then have different strategies and procedures that we follow to go after those goals. But for some students, they're going to need more support to understand how we go through that process. So the SDLMI was developed to allow this to happen and to really provide teachers with a way that they could support students in developing these skills. The nice thing, too, about the SDLMI is that it's not, you'll notice we call it a teaching model or a model of instruction. It's not a standalone curriculum. Instead, it's something that we recommend overlaying on other curricular areas or activities, meaning that if you're providing instruction related to reading, you can use the SDLMI as part of that instruction. You may embed some mini lessons prior to your reading instruction, but what you do is you get the student involved at that point in setting a goal related to what they're going to be learning and their outcomes in reading instruction, and then actively involve them in that process. The same thing we've used this related to um, thinking about transition, planning for employment related skills and different adult outcomes. Um, it's been used to support social skills. I mean, so there's um, many different ways that this framework can be used. So hopefully for all of you that are on the phone, um, you might be able to identify some ways that this strategy could be used in whatever type of environment you're working with students in. So essentially, the SDLMI is really a three-phase model. Um, first, students learn about and are supported in setting a goal, then in taking action towards that goal, and finally, in adjusting their goal or developing um, a new plan for either going after their goal or what their goal should be. And the idea here is that students cycle back through this. So sometimes when we set a goal, we develop a great action plan, we're able to make progress, and we achieve that goal then we'll probably go on to the next goal in our goal sequence. Um, so, but sometimes either our goal may be a little bit too ambitious or maybe our action plan um, wasn't as well thought out as it needed to be. So then we might need to adjust that goal or the plan and go back to the beginning and start again. But so this cyclical process that students go through, again, should sound very familiar to all of us in terms of things that we're doing in attempting to go after and set goals um, will support students in going through that process. So the SDLMI, um, in terms of what it looks like, when we think about each of those three phases, each phase has three different components. So it has student questions, which I'm going to show you in the next several slides. It also has teacher objectives, which are really um, providing a framework for you as a teacher, a support provider, in what am I hoping that the student's getting out of um, this process or this activity. So it kind of provides those instructional objectives and activities. And then educational supports are really related to what additional instruction, what resources might the student need to be able to answer these questions that we're going to be posing to them to enable them to go through the process and be the person that's able to set the goal, develop their action plan, and go over it. Um, so that's the general framework of the model. And anyone that's interested in more information, um, it didn't really work in a PowerPoint. It's better as a handout. But I, I have a breakdown of all of the student questions, teacher objectives, and other supports that you're welcome to email me for more information on if this is something um, that you'd like to dive a little deeper in. But let me give you just a quick overview of the different phases of the model with some examples of how we've worked with teachers through various projects to support them in um, working with their students um, to address the objectives of each of the different phases. So phase one. Uh, if you remember, that's all about setting that goal. So really, the student here is trying to solve this problem of what is my goal, which, you know, as we all know, sometimes identifying what that goal is can be a challenge. If you're using the SDLMI in the context of a specific instructional activity, maybe that's reading instruction, maybe it's, you know, planning for, you know, thinking about jobs in the future, um, you know, we'll structure this so that students are thinking about goals within those areas. 
And so students work through a process of answering four questions that are listed here. So what do I want to learn? What do I know about it now? What must change for me to learn what I don't know? And what can I do to make it happen? So again, we're starting at the beginning with students identifying what they're wanting to do with this and leading to at the end of this phase of students really being able to identify the concrete steps that they're going to start to go through to work to achieve this goal. Um, and these questions you know, can absolutely be modified. Um, we've done it just focusing in on kind of the overall what is my goal for students that um, the other questions can be too complex. Other students in some contexts will kind of go through and work to answer each of these questions. Others, it will be a little bit broad, more broad. So it, it, these absolutely can be kind of modified and accommodated, and students can be accommodated to access them in the ways that they need to. So, but here, the ultimate goal is for students to really be able to identify what their goal is. And um, so, again, this is, I already said a number of these things. It starts with the student identifying what they want to learn and ends with them having some idea of what they're going to do to make it happen. So let me talk to you about a couple of examples. And again, these are both examples from work that we've done with students, teachers, and schools in various projects um, where the SDLMI has been implemented. Um, the first example is of a student presentation, and um, this student, Jake, is also one that's highlighted in the Brooks book. But so, Jake, and many of you may have done this with students or, um, you know, have seen examples of this, but Jake, part of something that he was doing, he was in a class that was really focused on kind of transition planning, getting ready for the transition to um, college or employment. And so Jake's team was working with him um, to identify some ways that he could create a presentation about himself to help him with some of those both self-awareness and self-knowledge skills, but also issues related to self-advocacy so that he could give this presentation during his transition planning meeting with his entire team. Um, but one of the interesting things was that Jake's Team, and especially his family, who was very actively involved in the process, and even Jake, especially as time went on, they developed this great presentation, um, used it for um, planning in this IEP meeting, but then um, a lot of times it never really is used beyond that. But Jake's team was very creative in that Jake, who was transitioning to a community college, actually used his presentation as well during times that he was meeting with the disability support um, program at the community college because it gave him, you know, as a young man with autism um, that sometimes um, struggled in navigating, you know, interactions with new people and communicating his wants and needs, this gave him a tool that he was able to use to talk through that process. He also used it kind of more on the personal side with his family. He had some family members um, that still didn't have a great understanding of autism and some of the things. Jake's presentation involved, you know, some of those specific things that were relevant to his life um, in, in terms of what worked for him. So he was able to share that with family members as well. So there were a number of different ways, essentially opportunities that Jake had to use this information that he created to really assist him in identifying his goals for the future because his presentation ended with, you know, he wanted to go to community college. He actually wanted to study voice. He had perfect pitch and was very interested in those activities and, you know, how he needed to get a part-time job and other pieces like that. Another example, um, and I'm actually going to show you what this one looks like, was um, at other times when we've been implementing the SDLMI, especially in academic classes, um, this is going to be an example from a resource reading classroom. Sometimes um, it's very difficult if you go in and sit down with students and start asking, what, what goal do you want to work on? We find that students may not oftentimes have very good self-awareness of really what the goals that are going on related to reading in their classes and their schools are or where they're really situated um, in the context of what types of goals are appropriate for them given their strengths and their support needs. So this is actually um, a PowerPoint slide, or PowerPoint presentation that I've embedded in here and that we'll go through quickly. But so this was something um, that one of the teachers we were working with created. 
So this is what I was mentioning when sometimes we'll do mini lessons around the SDLMI. So again, this is in a resource reading class. The teacher would take about 15 minutes a couple of times a week to do some direct instruction around some of these self-determination skills. And then students would do um, the rest of their instructional activities with um, using and applying these skills as they were going through what they would typically go through. So the focus here was talking about self-awareness and identifying reading strengths and weaknesses and then using this information to create a goal related to reading. So this was just the advanced organizer slide telling the students what was going on. So here's a bit of an overview about what self-awareness is. It's knowing who you are. It's knowing how you achieve your goals. Um, we have to understand our strengths and weaknesses. Um, so then the students had actually done an assessment prior to this lesson that had asked them to rate themselves on some of the key things that differing students in the class were working on. So everyone did the same kind of general assessment, and it actually looked like this. So you'll see some range in the different activities listed here. This is very specific to the classroom and the students, but reading three-letter words, speaking a language other than English, reading two-page passages, typing, summarizing a story. So each student went through, and you'll see um, they would have marked a box um, that they could do these things or that they were struggling more with these things. Now, I'll admit that the first time the students did these assessments and the teacher wound up doing multiple versions of assessments depending on different activities that were going on, sometimes students struggled to even know how to fill out these assessments, meaning that reading three-letter words, they didn't know whether or not that was something that they could do. So we sometimes had to back up and actually go through the process of not just having the students complete the assessment, but kind of testing or going through the exercise of doing these skills and activities. But ultimately, the goal was to get students to a place where they were completing this self-assessment, and so they had a list of some of the things that they were good at. As you see, this student um, spoke Spanish. He spoke a language other than English, um, which was very common in the school we were working in, and he was good at typing, but struggled a lot in summarizing stories and then reading longer passages. So then, after the students completed the assessment, the goal was um, for them to be able to list the things that they do well and the things that need improvement. So you'll see this is actually from that same student um, just essentially transcribing what was on that self-assessment into this list, giving them the opportunity um, to be identifying strengths and areas of improvement. And focusing in on those strengths as well as the areas of improvement can be really important. So then the students, um, their next objective was to choose something to work on. So going back to this list of the things that need improvement, students would then be able to pick something that was going to be their targeted goal. Now, again, the teacher was actively involved in picking the different things that were on this self-assessment. So anything that was listed on here would be something that she would have wanted the students to be working on in the classroom anyways. So it's structured in a way that um, we're still able to meet the objectives that are going on during instruction, but um, that we're getting students involved up front and identifying what those needs are, and hopefully through the process taking more responsibility and meeting those needs. So um, the students looked at the skills, they picked the skills that they wanted to work on, and then they went through a process of, again, writing down what skill they wanted to improve, what identifying what they could do right now, what needs to change, and then what can you do. So these questions should look familiar because those are going back to the main questions from the SDLMI. And here's just this filled in for a student. Um, and this one, as you see at the very bottom, um, was struggling to identify things that they could do to make those changes happen. And in this classroom, I'm thinking of one classroom in particular that we worked with, this actually became a great process because the students were able to collaborate and support each other, as well as getting feedback from the teacher in terms of identifying um, what things you might want to think about doing and other pieces. Um, for example, one thing, um, just as an aside, um, in the class that came out of this was that, as I mentioned, a number of the students spoke Spanish, but the classroom didn't have Spanish to English dictionaries available in it. Um, they were available in the school somewhere else, but so the students, you know, decided to work on their advocacy skills 
and um, you know, went to the principal and asked for additional dictionaries so that they could have access to these things to support them in doing that. Um, so we really saw a lot of benefits across multiple areas of students getting more involved and thinking more about this process. But so this student now has the goal of writing a sentence with a capital letter at the beginning and a punctuation mark at the end. And then, so that became their goal for the class. And then the next mini lesson, so this would be the other day that the mini lesson was happening, they were gonna discuss self-management skills and developing an action plan for how the student's going to go about meeting that goal. And so that brings us to phase two of the model which is that process of creating an action plan of um, the student now has a goal, but as any of us know, sometimes it's really easy to think about something we'd like to do or a goal we might have, but unless we think about what strategies do we need to follow in meeting that goal and going after it, it can be a real challenge to get from point A to point B um, and to actually make progress on that. So the next piece of the model really is working directly with students, and a lot of the educational supports in this phase are going to be related to self-management skills. So really supporting students to develop skills to monitor their own behavior, to evaluate their own behavior, and to adjust and use different behaviors um, if they're not using strategies that are getting them where they need to go. So in this phase of the model, the goal really is for the student to figure out a plan that they're going to use um, to go after and to meet those goals. So there's a number of different ways um, and examples that we could share of how students go after and how students are supported in um, developing their plan and implementing it. Um, so for example, and I'm not going to take you through another extensive example, but following up on what we'd seen the lesson on self-awareness and reading awareness, um, the next lesson was very similar in that it was all about how you go after attaining a goal. So now I have my goal, so what are the actual steps that I need to take to break that, to go after that goal? So that oftentimes might be taking the goal of writing the sentence w with a capital letter at the beginning and punctuation at the end and um, breaking down the steps that are necessary to do that. You know, is it that the student doesn't know um, or doesn't easily distinguish between capital letters and lowercase letter letters or doesn't know their forms of punctuation? Is it they're not doing it consistently? Is it, I mean, what is the issue that they're needing to get into to be able to go after those things? Um, so that would be the same type of way of going about adding that in. Another example um, that I thought was a really good one from a school that we were working with was around self-advocacy. So one of the teachers we were working with really felt that a number of the students they were working with who were primarily going to be transitioning in the next year or two into community colleges and some of them into four-year colleges but they really weren't taking any responsibility um, for getting their own, um, for getting their accommodations set up in school. That was something that teachers primarily did or communicated or that you know happened in the IEP meeting, became part of the IEP, and they were just provided in the classroom. But in this case, the teacher wanted students to be much more actively involved in um, the role of um, you know, asking for their accommodations, making sure they were re receiving them to prepare them for that college environment. So um, what the teacher did, and let me, oh, I sorry, I think that I forgot to put the accommodation sheet in the PowerPoint, so I apologize for that, but let me describe it to you. Um, and again, I can email this to anyone that's interested later. But so what the teacher created was really just kind of a letter um, that the student would take to all of their teachers. So the student had to fill in all of the different accommodations they needed. Um, and the letter kind of went through the process of describing why those were needed. And then the student took that to each of their teachers, each of their you know, general education or other teachers, and showed it to the teacher, talked to the teacher about it, and the teacher had to sign off that they were doing it. Also, another great little innovation was that the teacher also created this little note card. Um, so it's something that you 
can do on the computer. You can type out and then print off um, onto that note card stock that you can get. But so the note card on it listed the student's accommodations. And again, this was something that the student did with support from the teacher. And then on the back of the card, it listed some steps or what to do if you didn't feel as though you were getting your accommodation. So, you know, step one, go talk to the teacher, um, you know, have a clear reason for why you need this accommodation, what it's going to be useful for for you, and so on. And so that was another great example of how students have the goal of being able to effectively advocate for themselves, especially thinking about transition. And this was a way that they were able to implement that to make sure that they were getting um, those supports that they needed in the school environment. Now, another example, and I, that's actually what's queued up on the next slide, um, this is from a student named Tony. So these were his, this is just the cover page, his vocational self-assessment forms. And so Tony was a student who was working primarily um, on some different vocational skills and really going through that process of attempting to both learn how well he was doing different aspects of job, but then also whether he liked those things and what could be enhanced. So for Tony, I'm gonna flip through some of these pictures. This was, and this would be something um, that could be embedded in technology. Pictures worked better, um, just printed out pages like this for him, for the environment that he was in. But this is something that could easily be loaded, you know, on an iPad or even an iPhone. But so Tony, you'll see he was having a job exploration experience um, at kind of, he lived in a semi-rural community um, and was interested in working at one of the local shops. And this was kind of a, uh, you see a tire here. They sold lots of different things related to kind of farming and other things like that. So Tony, um, though, was going through the process of rating how well he was doing in these different aspects of this job that he was going through. So this is something that he would do um, every day, although early on, I think when he was just getting started, he may do this. Um, or do some of the different activities, make multiple ratings even during his time on the job site. But so this is a form of self-monitoring where he's providing input into how well he's doing these different activities. So you see the rating scale along the bottom, poor, okay, great. And so he would rate himself on how well he was doing in each of these areas. His um, job coach would also provide the same ratings so that they could then compare those. And um, the job coach would also graph these so that over time, Tony could see the changes that he was making in different areas. And so one of the activities that he really worked on with his teachers was understanding what that change was when his ratings were changing and what that meant, um, which both helped him with his self-management skills as well as some numerical skills and other pieces like that. So this was really an example of, um, for a student with more significant support needs, ways that that self-management can be embedded in the broader goal of exploring jobs and figuring out the areas that he's good at. So I'll show you a couple of other shots. Here's another one. He loaded items into cars using good lifting procedures. Um, he looked at the boss um, when he or she was talking to him. That was an issue for Tony um, making eye contact and something he was really working on targeting. So as you saw from that, that was really a way for Tony um, to both, when he was on the job site, to be making ratings of the progress he was making in his goal areas, but then also to be learning other skills through evaluating that data and figuring out what was happening. It also becomes a product or a permanent product that can be used during the third phase of the model in the third and final phase of adjusting your goal or plan. So here the idea is really asking ourselves, so what have I learned? Or did I meet my goal? Um, you know, what actions have I taken? What barriers have been removed? Um, what's changed about what I don't know? And do I know what I need to know? So in terms of barriers that have been removed, the example I provided earlier about the class where they had to advocate to get um, Spanish to English dictionaries, um, you know, for students who had goals that that dictionary was a big piece of that process, that would be an example of something that could be talked about here as a barrier that had been removed. And again, I, sometimes, especially when students are first starting to use the model, it may be that they didn't take a lot of action. And oftentimes we see that happening because there wasn't a good action plan in place. 
So then that becomes really a teachable moment of going back and thinking about, well, what do we need to do here to make sure that we're monitoring how well we're doing on these things? Another scenario that can often happen is that students may set goals that are really unattainable either in the time frame they have or they may just be goals that are too big to be tackling all at once. You know, commonly students will, you know, oh, I want to get a job or, you know, I want to do this. And so this is a great opportunity if they've not been making much progress to think about, well, how do we break down and talk more um, about what those steps and goals are? So maybe it's not getting a job. Maybe the first goal in the goal sequence is researching, you know, how to apply for jobs or researching what jobs are available in the community that I want to live in and going through that process with those. But so a key piece here really is that self-evaluation. And um, for example, this going back to Tony and his self-assessment forms, um, what's actually here, so you might notice these are the same pictures. So these were all of the different areas that Tony was working on from what I showed you previously under phase two. But here at the end, Tony was also able to set goals for himself for next time in terms of the areas that he wanted to work on. So after looking at that data on the progress that had been made, the work that he'd been doing, um, here's a chance for him to be involved in, well, you know, maybe I didn't do such a good job today of loading items into the customer's cars, so that's going to be my goal for the next time. I'm going to come in and focus in on that area. Then he and his teacher or job coach could identify some of the action plan steps that may be needed. So if I want to focus in on this area, what do I need to do? What were the barriers that were there for me being successful there? and um, what different things may I need to put in place to make sure that I am successful there in the future. Um, the same thing, thinking back to the example of um, the reading class where the students went through their self-assessment, set their own goals. So they also had self-monitoring sheets. So after each student had their goal, they actually wrote their goal. Um, this school had you know, daily planner books for students um, that they kept all their assignments and things organized. So the students would write their goals in this notebook, and then the teacher created some very nice, quick and easy self-monitoring sheets. So of the student whose goal was related to, um, I'm going to write my sentence with a capital letter and punctuation at the end, they would track the number of days or the number of activities or however it was structured for that goal where the student met their goal. And so the student would then individually track their data in the planner. The teacher would track it as well so that you had both sources of information. But the other nice thing, especially at the classroom level, was that we also embedded in an element of kind of class-wide monitoring and evaluation, meaning that students' um, data was combined together um, to see how many students were making progress towards goals and how the class was doing and making progress. And various reinforcers were built into that. The students, you know, could earn a breakfast taco party at the end of the week if, you know, such and such a percentage of students had met the goals. And so the students got really engaged and excited about calculating, you know, how many students needed to do this. If one student wasn't making a lot of progress, the students would, again, support each other and get involved with each other. So it really changed the dynamic of that classroom in a number of different ways. The students were much more engaged in their learning. They took much more responsibility for their goals, for their learning. But again, working on the same content, the same with these transition-related examples. You know, Tony would get really excited um, when he was making progress or when his ratings were getting higher and higher in some areas. And, um, you know, and then he would, all, he would pick the ones where he had lower areas because he wanted to make the same progress there. Um, so the idea here is that we're teaching these critical self-determination skills, but then providing opportunities for the students to be using them in their day-to-day -day practices and work. So really, the idea is Goal setting um, is many people, um, you know, will talk about goal setting as something that's a very critical element of being a causal agent, of being a person that's self-directed, going after things. And I've ho I hope too that I've highlighted that goal setting and supporting goal setting can look very different depending on the students you're supporting and their support needs. You know, it can be more kind of whole class 
um, lots of paper and pencil or computer-based activities. In some environments, in other cases, it may be much more structured, um, individualized supports to different activities, using pictures, using technology, using other pieces like that. But all students can really get involved in this process of setting goals. And it really gives students that idea or that statement or that vision of what they're trying to accomplish. So they have something to link their actions back to. It's also you want goals to be something that where you can see the end of that goal. Um, so as I mentioned, some students, and I think this is true of all students with and without disabilities, often will set very large goals or goals that need to be broken down further. And this framework can be a very nice way to support students to think through, you know, I've set a big goal, but I'm not making any progress. So now how can I revise my goals so that I can take action and go after that? Um, it is, though, really important um, to remember that with goals, as with any curricular or instructional areas, we want to have high expectations because we know that setting goals, especially setting goals that push us and that challenge us, um, allow us to act more self-determined and to express more of these skills. So when goals are difficult, um, they tend to support us in being more productive. But we also don't want goals that are outside um, of personal competencies. So it's important to find that balance and to work with students in going through that process. Now again, um, some opportunities to fail, meaning that a student may set a goal that's outside of their personal competence, but then if we're able to use this process to be thinking about that evaluation piece of, well, you know, why wasn't this goal achievable? Why was this one area consistently staying really low on my evaluation sheet? You know, what is it about that? You know, maybe it's a student, um, going back to Tony's example, you know, trying to lift and do other things. Maybe the student doesn't have some of um, the physical strength in certain parts of his body that en enable that lifting. So maybe there's a need for differing accommodations or differing types of job environments or other pieces there. But so when we think about that as something to have discussions and supports around for students, um, they can learn much more about how to set goals that are challenging, but just challenging enough. Um, so when we're thinking about promoting self-determination within the context of the SDLMI or going back to our list of all of the different choices and skills um, that we talked about, choice making, problem solving, goal setting, and so on, um, we really want to think about those high expectations and Again, that key piece of opportunities and recognizing that sometimes it may be opportunities to not be successful, but having that be in a safe environment where it can be a learning opportunity. Um, building partnerships, you know, so I mentioned with Jake's family in particular, there was a good home school partnership there, as well as the supports um, that are needed for success. So I did want to just tell you a story too. So I mentioned Jake and Sorry, I'm trying to get the slide to go forward. There we go. So this is actually a picture, and um, this story is um, highlighted in, um, in the book and then in some different um, work that I've done with Jake. But so Jake was a student. Um, this is actually a framed picture. You see Jake's little picture up there. He was a staff writer for the newspaper. This is a framed picture from the football coach at his school. So the situation here was that Jake um, and his IEP team were planning the courses that he was going to take, and I believe this was during his sophomore year, although um, I'm not remembering exactly off the top of my head. But so they were talking about courses to take, and Jake was really interested in taking this writing class or the newspaper and being part of the newspaper team primarily because writing um, was an area that he sometimes struggled with, and he definitely wanted to go on to community college, so that was a strong goal for him, and he felt this would be a good opportunity. Um, his IEP team, though, was very concerned about this for several reasons that are all very valid reasons. So newspaper writing, um, one of Jake's accommodation in most of his other classes was extended time for completing different activities. But with a newspaper, you really can't have extended time as a reasonable accommodation because the newspaper has to get published, the stories have to get out there. Also, 
also, you know, in terms of reporting, doing interviewing and other pieces like that, it was, you know, Jake's social interactions with others um, were sometimes an area that he needed supports and was still had some goals around um, improving some of those areas. So the IEP team was really struggling. Is this the right activity for him? Jake was very much, I want to try it. You know, I know that I may not be successful, but I want to try. This is really important to me. Um, and so ultimately his mother um, and his father as well, his family really supported him that if this is something that you want to do, we want to give you this opportunity. So here's an opportunity. Jake is expressing a preference. Um, you know, saying that he understands some of the barriers that might come up, um, but still saying that this is his preference and that they want to go after that. Although one of the things that his IEP team then did was really work with Jake using the SDLMI around, well, what barriers might you encounter and what supports do we need to put in place um, to promote success here? So um, because we're running low on time, let me kind of move along, wrap up this story. Um, Jake, the supports wound up being that he was going to have kind of a partner. He and another person on the newspaper were going to work together to aid in some of those social pieces. And, um, you know, Jake tried to work on his assignments, get them in very quickly. There were some supports and making sure deadlines were very clear and those were written out and followed. But what wound up happening is that Jake um, has an excellent memory. He loves um, sports facts. I mean, I could call him right now and he could tell me all of the football scores from over the weekend and other pieces. So he was able to synthesize and integrate information related to especially sports much quicker than many of the other people um, on the newspaper staff. So he actually wound up being a great sports writer and contributed such a lot. And this is actually from the football coach who really enjoyed his writing, thought that he did a better job than a number of other reporters had over time in reporting on these findings. So the idea of high expectations, giving Jake that chance um, to go through those opportunities and using the SDLMI to structure that. So ultimately, um, when we're thinking about using and teaching these skills, talk with the students about goal setting and self-advocacy, start that dialogue around that. Um, think about what the student's role is and what your role is. So the student's going to learn to set goals and develop plans for doing that. You're going to support the students in doing that. And then it's all about teaching those needed skills. So maybe it's self-awareness skills of students understanding where they are in reading. Maybe it's something else. Create the opportunities and provide supports and accommodations. And um, finally, this, this is my very last slide, I also want to highlight um, the importance of all of us in thinking about our roles in creating opportunities that it's both about supporting students and creating opportunities for the students, but looking more broadly at our support or our school culture and what we can do to make sure that our schools are supportive of self-determination. We often call this having an impetus person in a school or a person that really brings this to attention. And this slide has a list of questions um, around what you can do to look at um, what people know, what they understand about self-determination in your school, and what support supports you can have to make this something that becomes a reality for more and more students. Um, so according to my clock, I have three minutes left, although I haven't seen, I've been keeping my eye on no questions coming in. So if people have questions or comments, feel free to, you know, quickly type them in the box and we can attempt to pull them together. But let me just say thanks to all of you for being here, for listening to me um, for this hour. I hope um, people got some information that was useful, and feel free to follow up with me over email, um, and I'm happy to talk more about any of the areas um, that we've mentioned today. And so I'm not seeing any questions, Barb. I don't know if I'm assuming that you're not getting anything either. No, I don't, but I wanted okay. to thank you, Carrie, for a great session, um, and I suspect people may write to you. You really... Um, raised some good ideas about the whole planning process. So I, I, I know some about self-determination, but you've added to my knowledge today, so I want to thank you for that. Um, and thanks to the audience. I, I believe this is our largest audience, so you, you were quite, your topic was um, one that people were interested in. I will be following up with everybody um, after today's session, probably in a couple of days, if not later today, 
um, and I'll send you the recording um, and the PowerPoint. I think it's um, information you can share with your colleagues. And if you have questions, you can email me at barb at mcie.org, um, or if you have comments about the session. I want to remind you again to watch for the information on the spring series, which should be out by the 15th. Um, oh, here we go. Paul Riley. Thank you, Paul. He's telling us, uh, Carrie, thank you so much. We like that. That's okay, <laughs> yes. too. People, I think they, they think they have to write a question, but you can actually just um, send good wishes. Um, so if no one has anything else, then I wish you all a great day. Thanks again for attending. Thanks, Carrie. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Barb.